53 years ago this weekend, the Beatles released what turned out to be their final studio album, Abbey Road. Not only did it contain some of their finest songs, it was also their best sounding record. But why was that? And is this $200 1980s Japanese CD the best way to hear it? I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and in this video, I'll not only answer those questions, but I'll also compare seven of the most popular pressings of this album and find out which one really does sound the best. Everyone has their own ideas as to what the Beatles' best album is. But few can argue against Abbey Road being the best produced, best recorded, best engineered, and best sounding of all their original albums. The album marked a turning point, not only for the Beatles, but also for the sound of rock music in the decade ahead. So what made this album sound so good? And what did it have that all their previous studio albums didn't? One of the main reasons for the improvement in sound quality was the introduction of a new mixing desk. All of the Beatles recordings up to that point had been made through the All Valve RED 51 desk. RED stood for Record Engineering Development Department. Despite its legendary status, this EMI engineered desk was pretty limited in its functionality. For example, it had just two preset EQ settings, pop and classical, and relied heavily on patched in outboard gear, such as Altec compressors and Fairchild limiters. It had just eight microphone inputs and four outputs, and had for some years struggled to meet the demands of the Beatles studio experimentation, let alone Abbey Road's newly installed eight track recorder. Unknown to the Beatles, EMI had been working on this desk for a number of years, and it was to be their first transistorized desk, named the TG12345. The prototype console had been installed in the Abbey Road experimental room in the early summer of 1968, but wasn't installed in Studio 2 at Abbey Road until after the White Album sessions on November the 23rd of that year. Unlike the old red desks, the new TG12345 had built-in limiters and compressors, which were modeled on the old Altex and Fairchilds. It also had treble and bass controls on each individual channel, as well as more EQ available on grouped channels and the main outputs. Abbey Road was the only Beatles album to be recorded and mixed on the new TG desk. The effect of this new desk was to make the sound rounder and brighter, and gave them their best sounding recordings since the Polydor sessions in Hamburg. But the changeover from tubes to transistors didn't please everyone, especially the album's engineer, Jeff Emmerich. He'd gotten used to and preferred the punchier sound of the old tube console and four track recorder, and found it impossible to get the same drum and guitar sound or the same warm harmonic distortion he and the band had become used to. But there was no going back, and the new mixer did have some clear advantages over the tube driven red desk. Firstly, it produced smoother tones, and the transistors prevented low end distortion from passing through. Secondly, each instrument became more defined. The bass and other low-end elements were tighter and cleaner, and it produced a kind of high-end sparkle over everything. Thirdly, the new console perfectly captured the tone of McCartney's bass, without turning the bottom end of the frequency spectrum into mush. This can be heard most evidently on I Want You, She's So Heavy, and even more so on Something, where his bass lines, although very busy, perfectly complement Harrison's vocals without overpowering it. It was a sound which was well suited to a lot of songs on the album. And because the rhythm tracks were better recorded, the overdubs were a little softer, and everything sat together a little easier in the mix. This all resulted in the album being a much gentler sounding record, and sonically very different from every other Beatles album. In fact, it doesn't sound like it was recorded in the 1960s at all. The same desk was also used on several solo Beatles recordings, notably John Lennon's Instant Karma and Ringo's Sentimental Journey album. Paul's Maybe I'm Amazed and Every Night were also both recorded and mixed on the same desk, as was George's masterpiece All Things Must Pass. The sonic signature of this desk went on to shape the sound of most rock albums in the 1970s, the best example being Dark Side of the Moon, 
which was recorded on the Mark IV version of the console. Abbey Road was released on the 26th of September 1969 in the UK and the 1st of October in the United States. And for many people, these first pressings remain their preferred versions of this album. But as time went on, other formats were introduced, which prioritised convenience and portability over sound quality. First, there was the compact cassette, which was introduced in the UK in November 1969. To make each side the same length and save tape, EMI swapped the opening tracks of each side. So side one on this cassette and the US one too opens up with Here Comes the Sun and side two with Come Together. Now this track configuration remained the same up until the introduction of the XDR, Extended Dynamic Range cassettes in 1987, which were the first sourced from digital masters. Next up was the eight track tape which because it was introduced after the cassette has a different track listing, which is also different to the one found in the US. The US one sensibly opens up with Come Together, while the UK tape starts off with, in my opinion, the album's worst track, Maxwell's Silver Hammer. The album's first audio file release came in 1978 in a series of albums released in Japan by Toshiba and EMI called Pro Use. This was cut from a 30 inches per second copy of the original Abbey Road master tape, which is documented on the album's original tape box as being done on January the 16th, 1978. The next company to exploit the growing audiophile market were Mobile Fidelity when they released their original master recording LP in January 1980. In November 1982, Japan became the first country to launch the CD and Toshiba decided to take advantage of the high-quality tape they'd used for the pro-use vinyl and make the world's first official Beatles CD. Now, unlike the vinyl where compromises had to be made, the Abbey Road tape was transferred flat onto the CD without any additional compression, limiting or other mastering tricks. So the sound on this CD is as close as you can get to the sound on the master tape, warts and all. And because Toshiba didn't yet have a working CD production plant, the earliest copies of this CD were pressed by CBS Sony. Now, EMI wasn't happy with this release and ordered Toshiba to stop production, but that wasn't before 10,000 copies had been made. It was finally withdrawn from sale in June 1985. The album was released worldwide officially on CD on November the 19th, 1987. But we had to wait nearly 22 years for the remastered edition, which eventually appeared in 2009. Finally, 10 years later in 2019, we got the 50th anniversary remix edition with all those wonderful outtakes. But which out of all those editions sounds the best? What I'm gonna do is take you through each one and give you my opinion about its sound quality. Then at the end, I'll rank them from worst to best. Right, let's start at the beginning with the UK first pressing on Apple, PCS7088. This was cut by Malcolm Davis at Apple and initial pressings have the matrix numbers YEX749-2 on side one and YEX750-1 on side two. Now for many, including myself, Malcolm Davis's initial cutting has been the benchmark against which every other pressing has been measured since. Sadly, Malcolm Davis passed away in 2015, but I remember going round to his house in the early 1990s with a dealer to buy his record collection. He still had all of the original Apple albums and even still had the keys to the Apple Studios, which I remember were on one of those Apple key rings. I remember chatting to him briefly about his career, but it was mainly concerning his work at Pi, where he cut loads of great sounding pressings from 1967 to 1969. But let's now take a look at those other pressings to see how they measure up against the UK-2-1. As you know, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, I've never been very complimentary about US pressings of Beatles albums, the Capitol ones especially. And for years, I've read about how poor the US Apple pressings are. So my expectations were pretty low when I spanned this US first pressing. But I was genuinely surprised about how good it sounded. 
Although it lacks the presence and transparency of the UK pressing, it's clean and warm, and there's more to like about it than dislike. Like many Japanese pressings, the pro-used Toshiba edition is very well-mannered and reserved, especially in the bass department. But overall, the sound is very detailed, and the vinyl is extremely quiet. The sound on the Mobile Fidelity from 1980 is very different. In all honesty, given the fact that they had the original tape to work with, this should have been so much better than it was. One can't blame the cutting engineer, Stan Ricker, for its shortcomings. That was all down to Mobile Fidelity Management, who basically castrated the sound of this album. By boosting the low and high ends, they succeeded in sucking all of the mid-range out of the sound, making everything too soft and sleepy. This EQ configuration is sometimes known as Smiley Face EQ. It was applied to all of the Beatles albums issued by Mobile Fidelity, so don't waste your money on them or this overpriced box set. If you want a great sounding box set of their studio albums, do yourself a favor and get one of these instead. The UK or Dutch editions are, in my opinion, the best of the bunch, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed. Next up is that first Japanese CD, which is also known as the Black Triangle CD. But before we get into how it sounds, there's something important you have to know about this CD. Like most CDs in the early 1980s that were mastered in Japan, this has been mastered with something called pre-emphasis. Basically, pre-emphasis was a noise reduction technique for CDs, in the same way that the Dolby noise reduction system was used for tape. But why did they need a noise reduction system for CDs? Well, some early digital recording and playback equipment used 14-bit converters, even though they were dealing with 16-bit audio. Some even used noisy brick wall filters to remove frequencies higher than 22,050 Hertz. The resulting noise introduced by these converters and filters could be reduced by using pre-emphasis, i.e. boosting the higher frequencies in the mastering before it was put onto CD. Flags were then embedded into the disc's subcode to tell the CD player to apply de-emphasis on playback. And some CD players had a de-emphasis button that could be used to manually apply de-emphasis. But now it's just a built-in feature of the analog outputs of nearly all dedicated audio CD players. With the introduction of more reliable 16-bit digital audio converters in the late 1980s, the practice of adding pre-emphasis was stopped. Now, whilst almost all CD players will properly de-emphasize a CD that has had pre-emphasis applied to it, most computers will not. So if you buy a copy of this CD today, which of course has pre-emphasis applied to it, and play it back on your computer or via an external drive, for example, it'll sound like you've got the treble turned up to 10 and everything will be too bright. And sometimes this overload of clarity can convince some people into thinking that this CD sounds better when compared to the others. So in order to listen to it correctly via a computer, you'll need some software which will de-emphasize the CD. I, for example, use the DB Power Amp Music Converter, which has such a setting in it. But of course, other programs are available. Only by playing this CD on the correct equipment or using de-emphasis software will allow you to hear the sound on it accurately. Another issue with this CD is that it's been heavily counterfeited, but there are ways of telling counterfeits from the real thing. For example, the front cover lacks the compact disc logo in the upper left and the catalog number in the front upper right. Counterfeits also have black spines. The originals have yellow spines, which look like this. Also, there's no barcode on the rear of the originals. On the disc itself, the major giveaway of a counterfeit is that the black triangle extends over the hub. The genuine CDs have a clear ring here. Also, the counterfeits all have the same matrix number, which is CP35-3016-17 a1. However, my disc, although being the genuine article, has that same matrix. The key here is the letter A, which looks like this on the counterfeit, as compared to this on the original, which is made up of five lines rather than three. So once you've got your original disc and played it back with de-emphasis, the sound quality is tremendous. And there's even some audible tape hiss in some places. 
It's certainly the most neutral and natural sounding of the discs I've tried so far, and is the closest to the UK first pressing vinyl, which being analog is a little warmer. Now onto the UK 1987 CD, which incidentally sounds exactly the same as the US CD. The big thing that surprised me here is that there isn't much difference between this and the Black Triangle CD, and in a blind test you'd be very hard pushed to tell them apart. Now of course the big shift in sound comes when we get to the 2009 remaster. Now this CD is much louder than the 1987 and Black Triangle, 3 to 4 decibels louder in fact. I also compared this with the FLAC files from the USB, and found that they both contain the exact same EQ, compression, limiting and noise reduction as each other. The only difference between them is that the CD files are 16-bit and the USB ones are 24-bit. Now the 24-bit files had the potential to carry a more dynamic sound, but sadly both it and the CD were subjected to peak limiting, and as a result sound identical to each other. Now like many, I found the 2009 to be too bass heavy, and generally overpowering, especially after listening to all the previous versions. I don't think it's possible or indeed fair to compare any of these to the 2019 remix, because it sounds so different to the original mix. That's not to say I don't enjoy the remix, I do, but given the choice I'd rather listen to the original. So let's sum up by giving you my ranking for the best sounding Abbey Road, from worst to best. In last place it's the MFSL. That smiley face EQ takes all the balls out of the sound and reduces it to little more than music to my ears. It may be some people's cup of tea, but not mine. Next is the 2009 remaster. Now this one does have balls, but too much for me. I'm going to put the US first pressing next, which as I said earlier surprised me. But for those who've owned it since 1969, it'll be no surprise at all. Fourth place goes to the 1987 CD, which also isn't as bad as many people make it out to be. It really is a good representation of the album and much closer to the next one in the list than it's given credit for. In third place it's the Japanese Pro Use Vinyl. Now I put it ahead of the 1987 CD, mainly because I prefer vinyl, but it has bags of detail and clarity and the vinyl itself is super quiet. Second place goes to the Black Triangle CD. It's just a shade more neutral than the 1987. But is it worth paying a minimum of $200 for? I'd say no. It's worth it maybe as an artifact or if you have a very high end system, but this and the 1987 are very close. The top spot, perhaps unsurprisingly, goes to the original UK-2-1 pressing. It was cut when the tape was at its freshest by someone who really knew what they were doing. It's also not as difficult or expensive to find as you may think. The initial Dash 2 Dash 1 cutting was not recut until September 1976, so there's seven years worth of great sounding pressings out there. Your main concern with this pressing is going to be finding a quiet one. As you can see, I've got many which aren't. As always, that's just my opinion. Do let me and everyone else know in the comments what your favourite version of this album is and why. I'm sure you are, like me, very excited about the forthcoming Revolver set, but if you're holding off pre-ordering it, I'll be reviewing it shortly after release and we'll let you know if it's worth the money. In the meantime, we've got some fascinating Revolver content coming up, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on that. Also, do check out our other videos and website, parlogramauctions.com, where you'll find lots of great sounding Beatles vinyl for sale. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you'll join me again next week. But that's it for this one, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching. <laughs>